talked with Sue a bit in the past as well about what this means to be a provost in this kind of an arrangement. So uh, these have been very constructive conversations, and I think you're going to find this to be a very helpful session here this afternoon. Uh, today's event has, uh, has essentially four parts. First of all, I will offer brief remarks, and I am now in the process of brief remarks. Uh, then I'll ask Andrew Laws, who's the managing director from Huron, to offer some perspectives on this process from, uh, from Huron's vantage point. And then third, each of our panelists will make an opening statement that talks about his or her experience with a ramp similar process. And then we'll end up with about 45 minutes or so with questions and comments from, uh, from, from you all. Uh, to state the obvious, it's very important that you all are here. This is a continuation of a conversation that started early in this, in this calendar year when WKU first invited Huron to come to campus to, to assist in the development of a new performance-based resource allocation management and planning model, the RAMP model. And starting again early in, in this calendar year, Ann Mead and I have co-chaired a steering committee that's led this RAMP process, RAMP development process. Steering committee has about uh, 14 members, represents a broad group of uh, folks chosen from across the university, and we've been a kind of a decision-making resource, and we've been tasked with providing some guidance for, for this initiative. Uh, we're reviewing project status reports and trying to validate or assess the opportunities that get presented to us. In support of this effort, the university has contracted with Huron Consulting Group, and Huron has facilitated a customized ramp redesign approach for WKU that we feel like really takes into account our institution's unique strengths, its distinctive culture, and very importantly, I think what we value as an institution. Huron's a leading provider of budget-related uh, services in higher education, and it's done this sort of thing for 45 other folks already. Uh, and I, I'll ask Andrew to talk a little bit more specifically about this. But obviously, the success of this whole initiative depends upon the feedback and the support from a whole variety of stakeholders, and that's to make sure that this redesigned model really does fit with our strengths, our culture, our values, and the strategic priorities for, for this institution. And that's what all kind of brings us to today's event. And kind of in that spirit, I'd like to ask Andrew Laws from Huron Consulting to take it from here and uh, make a few comments of his own and introduce the panel. <clears throat> Thank you, David. So I don't really have many comments because um, this is really about the panel, and I'm, I'm here more to facilitate the panel um, later today or the Q&A. What I would add, though, um, in case – some of you were not at the, you know, David said this is a continuation of the conversation in case any of you were not able to make our open forum a few weeks ago. A couple of key points. So one, what is RAMP? Really what we're talking about is helping the university develop a new process, a new approach for resource <coughs> allocation management and planning. So how do we facilitate the right budgeting conversations at the university? And really what we are, what the steering com committee is coming to is this idea that we want a more decentralized, a more incentive-based, and a more transparent budget process and budget model. And so in bringing in panelists, what we wanted to do is not bring in individuals who have familiarity with one particular model or the exact model that we're implementing, but individuals who know about decentralized, incentive-based, transparent models because there's a lot of decisions you can make within that. And so really that's where we are and that's the, the, the quick of, of um, what you may have missed at the first panel discussion. The second thing I would say is that we really have outlined about an 18-month process for this transition to take place. And so that's about 78 weeks and we're in about week 18 or 19 of that, maybe week 20. So we are still early in this long process, and um, um, we've, we've put the steering committee through a number of hoops, and they've met five or six times, um, but there's still a lot that we need to figure out, and um, that's part of the reason why we want to, to, to get these lessons learned and think about how we want to move forward. So um, the other thing I would say about the panel discussion is We've done these kind of panel discussions at um, probably the last 10 
of 45 institutions that we've helped go through this process. And what we consistently hear is that this is one of the most valuable sessions for stakeholders, that it's really valuable to hear from other universities as opposed to hearing from consultants or your, your campus leaders. And so that's what we wanted to do. When we started out, we really identified about six stake or about six panelists as potential panelists, and we tried to get a cross section of individuals from um, the dean suite, from the provost office, from the finance office, so you could get different perspectives. We tried to find institutions that were um, relatively new to decentralized budgeting, as well as institutions that had fairly mature models, and. Um, as you might imagine in these kind of events, what ultimately happens is it comes down to the dates of availability, right? So we picked a date, and I think we're extremely lucky to have the three panelists that we ended up with today because we've got a, a great cross-section. Um, we've got um, different disciplines represented in education, engineering, and arts. We have um, different positions across the university, and again, different levels of maturity in terms of a decentralized budget model. So with that, I want to simply read the, the short bios of each of our panelists so you'll know who is here, and then I'm going to turn it over to the panel. So um, I'll start at the far end. So Sue Ott Rollins is the Provost and Executive Vice President at Northern Kentucky University. So Sue joined NKU and, as Provost in January of 2014. Prior to that, she was Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences at Virginia Tech for well, it's like six years, um, prior to which she was Interim Dean at the University of Toledo. Prior to her appointment there, she served as Chair of the Department of Theater and Film at Toledo, and she was also an Associate Professor and Head of Acting and the Directing Program for the Department of Theater at Ohio State University. She was the Founding Artistic Director for the Galaxy Theater um, Collective in Toledo and the Cleveland's Women Theater Project. She is a former Associate Artistic Director of the Roundhouse Theater in Washington, D.C. and Managing Director of the Actor Space in New York City. Number two, Hisham el is the Dean of the College of Engineering and Mind at the University of North Dakota. So Hisham has served as the Dean of Engineering and Mind since, June, since July of 2008. He's also a full professor of electrical engineering at the college. Before coming to UND, Hasham was a full professor and chairman of the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at Southern Methodist University, which was designated as a National Center of Academic Excellence in Information Assurance Education by the National Security Agency. Prior to that, he was professor at the University of Nebraska at Omaha for 11 years, where he played a central role in his department prioritizing for major budget cuts, while at the same time preparing his department for internal and external reviews. He received his BS and MS in computer science from the University of Alexandria, and his PhD in computer science from Oregon State University. He's the co-author of five books in the fields of computer architecture and engineering. Last is Doug Priest. So I believe Doug's Doug is retired. I believe his current president title is Associate Professor Emeritus at Indiana University Bloomington in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies. So Doug joined Indiana University in 1972 and served as an Associate Professor in Higher Education and Student Affairs. During his time at IU, Doug held several roles, um, including Special Advisor to the Chancellor, Senior Associate Vice President for Finance, and Executive Associate Dean for Budgetary Administration and Planning. Doug directed doctoral dissertations and served on numerous campus and organizational committees, and he's the co-author of Incentive-Based Budgeting Systems in Public Universities, and he's published various works on responsibility center management, strategic planning, and student success. So with that, I will stop, and uh, each panelist is going to give us a five to seven minute overview of, of kind of their perspective and experience in this, and then we'll open it up to questions. Okay, thank you. Um, so let me just um, uh, tell you that uh, I'm very happy to be here. It's the first time I've been on Western's campus. 
It's really beautiful. It's uh, very hilly too, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, but uh, I, I just arrived last night at 1.30 in the morning from Iceland, which is also a beautiful country. And uh, it was a vacation and uh, drove down here this morning and, and forgot you were in central time. So uh, I, I think I'm back together again right now, but uh, just to give you a little bit of a preface on you know some jet laggy stuff happening here. Um, when I arrived uh, in January 2014 uh, at NKU, um, the president, new president, Jeff Mearns, had been there for uh, six months and asked me the first thing to co-chair a task force on a potential new budget model for the university. Um, and, and this is a, a great experience of working outside your comfort zone. So I co-chaired a task force. Uh, took the next year to, to do that, and we recommended uh, that we would go with an incentive-based decentralized uh, budget model. He, he wanted to know this recommendation because as he did a listening tour in his first few weeks on campus, he kept hearing over and over again that people were dissatisfied with this sort of mysterious uh, black hole called the budget office that things would fall into and then you'd get money at the beginning of every year but you never really knew why you got what you got something to do with how much you got last year but then you know no matter what you did it, it didn't really change your financial situation at the department or college level and so uh he was hearing the desire for more transparency and, and a, a, a model that would uh, provide some clarity around how we determine budgets uh, on campus. And so fast forward to 2016-17, um, by that time we had spent about, I don't know, nine or 10 months designing the model. We had uh, done a spree of communication uh, forums and 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 uh, meetings and engage faculty senate, faculty senate budget committee, staff congress, uh, the SGA, every group that we could get in front of to describe how this uh, model was being designed to actually operate, and that process took about a year and a half. And so that the year of 2016-17 was our shadow year, the year in which we were operating as we always had, but we were running this new budget model in the background to see how we would fare uh, under it. Um, and, and then last July 1st of 2017, we actually went live. Uh, so for, for uh, this year, this is our first year, uh, our deans, uh, uh, our budget officers, myself, we're all eagerly kind, trying to look and see what's happening. One of the things that you have to understand is that it's always a work in progress. You don't just sort of suddenly flip a switch and, and life is totally different. Uh, so we are still assessing, we're, we're looking at numbers, we're waiting for the actual revenue numbers to come in for this past year, the final numbers. We'll, we'll know how each of the colleges did, I hope, within the next few weeks, and, uh, and, and we'll go from there. But I, I will end by just saying that, that there are three things that I hope will resonate with you and we can keep coming back to during the course of this conversation. Um, Obviously, we're both uh, uh, universities in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. We share a lot of uh, good things and a lot of challenges. Um, and uh, so we also share the fact that we're going through change. You have a new president. We are getting a new president. Uh, you have new a new provost coming in. I don't think we're getting a new provost, but <laughs> we are. We are. What do I know? We 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 are getting new deans. Uh, so and and it's always like that. So so change is not a reason to not do something, right? And and the second thing is 
budget restraints, uh, budget cutting. We, we both have been through this a lot as universities. It's not a reason not to do something that you need to do. Uh, and, and the third thing, most important, the governance systems that you set up to facilitate shared governance and communication around everything to do with the new budget model is going to be the most important thing for you as uh, an institution, everyone pulling in the same direction and having ultimately a successful experience with it. So the, I'll stop there and turn it over. Thank you. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? You have a beautiful campus. I want you to know that. And it was so empty in the morning when I came. And I was um, so happy to see all of you here today. So <laughs> where were you? Okay. All right. So um, the, uh, she came from Iceland. I came from the University of North Dakota. And there are some similarities between us. <laughs> The University of North Dakota is the flagship research university in the state of North Dakota. It has nine colleges, including College of Medicine, Nursing, Law, uh, Aerospace, Engineering, and, and the typical ones, Arts and Sciences, and, and uh, uh, Education, Business. Uh, I have joined the University of North Dakota back in 2008 as the Dean of the College of Engineering. And uh, every year in those 10 years, the college enrollment has increased. And that increase was not reflected at all in my budget allocation every year. So whether we increase, whether we decrease, our budget did not see, did not reflect that in, in an accurate, meaningful way. So that was one thing that uh, I noticed when I, uh, in my first five years. Um, another thing is um, I like to share budget information with the faculty and staff in my college. Uh, and that doing that was extremely difficult given the complexity. I just said, okay, guys, this is our salaries and this is our operating, done. So how do we compare to the other colleges? Um, how much revenues do we bring? Um, all the, how much do we contribute to helping other colleges? All this information um, was not... Uh, clear. Obviously, you can, you can dig and find information, but it would have been very, very uh, complex and uh, difficult situation. Uh, our research also increased, but at the same time, the budget did not reflect that. So it became inevitable for us to do something different. I know, the, I have to tell you, no model is perfect, including RCM. It's not perfect. But I realized, and my colleagues realized, that it is better than what we used to have. So I think we followed a, a, a timeline similar to what Sue mentioned. This is our first year in life. Um, and we've gone through the same phases. Um, and um, I think uh, people always ask questions, so why we do it, and, and uh, will it impact uh, how we do business and all that stuff. And uh, I think all these are valid questions and valid concerns. And I think one big piece of doing this, and, and I, we learned this as we went, is to be, we say that this model is to promote transparency in budget, but I think I would argue that we also need to be transparent in the implementation of the model and uh, engage and include and involve faculty, staff, deans in that process. Uh, and I think this is, uh, we are all in this together and we need to understand it together and uh, transition from what we do today 
to that one, to the new one. Also, I want to mention that higher education today is facing tremendous challenges. Uh, it's not a secret now that uh, state support for public universities has uh, shrunk considerably over the last uh, 10 years or so, and it's getting less and less. Even the federal funding for research and development also has declined considerably. And I think, that, so doing business as usual, uh, it's not going to help us prosper. Also, the challenges that are coming from um, the, the explosion in online uh, offering, and, and it also has undermined our existing traditional business models in public universities. So therefore, I think change is important, change is inevitable, and a change is difficult, but not bad. I think we need to do that. So I think I'm going to leave it there, and maybe uh, I'd be happy to answer questions about my experience as a dean in this process. Uh, I was part of the steering committee that, that got this model off the ground. And, um, and also, I, I worked with the implementation team in communicating what happens in the implementation to the campus and to my college. And currently, I'm a member of uh, one of the governing committees, uh, the Executive Budget Committee. Thank you. Well, yeah, I'll um, <clears throat> depart a little bit from what Andrew instructed, and pardon my, my hoarseness here, um, and try to give you some information that might help you ask questions later to get at the things that you're interested in. Um, one thing is, go back in our history and it's been mentioned here how we get started with this sort of thing. I'm re I was reminded of how we went into this with our Budgetary Affairs Committee, Faculty Council. Um, their rousing endorsement was, after spending quite a few meetings with them, that when we look at the system we have now, which was highly participative, and we look at this RCM thing, we think we'd be a little bit happier with this RCM thing, so let's try it. And I think the faculty over time, uh, by and large, have um, you know, ma maintained that, that view of things. It didn't hurt us at all. You know, say we have a pretty good history of faculty participation in these sorts of things. Our chancellor at the time was a previous chair of the Budgetary Affairs Committee Faculty Council. And it was uh, that along with being Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences was his background, and he was a, uh, a strong proponent of this system. Um, to help you ask questions, a, a faculty member taught a PhD program in higher education. Pretty routinely, I taught finance and higher education, some administration, both which were allowed me to, to talk about in the classroom what I, what I was doing in the office spent probably equal amounts of time in academic affairs and finance. And most recently, just in the last couple of years, helped uh, along with a former student of mine, implemented an RCM approach at Temple University, which seems to be going, going well. Um, during the time I've been in higher education, there are lots of fads. And in these fads, they come and go, and we latch on to them, and the next one comes along. One thing I'll say for this, though, is this um, incentive-based budgeting RCM model is that it, it's one that's persisted you know, over over 30 years, and it's continued to grow in, in popularity as institutions have become more, uh, public institutions have become more tuition-dependent. It's, uh, you know, the, the promise is, or the um, indication is, it's a model that's going to help with cost cutting in some overhead areas and, and enhance revenue. And, and that tends to be true. But I would suggest, myself at least, I think the most important outcome of this um, implementation of these systems is the integration of academic, financial, and administrative planning, the breaking down of silos, the shared information, and the sharing and coordination of as academic aspirations. The academic side of the house really, really needs to lead this. The financial side of the house needs to facilitate this. It's a, 
You know, it, it's a dance that's different at every institution. Hence, the implementation is different at every institution. It's one of the reasons it hasn't been a fad so much. These things, if, if you adopt any of these things in a <clears throat> theoretically pristine way, they're going to go away. But if you adapt these basic concepts to your institution and your values, they can be very powerful and helpful to you in the long run. And, and before I go into full lecture mode, I'll quit there. Great, thank you. Those were very valuable introductions. And so now I think we've got about 45 minutes, and uh, we'll use as, as much of that time as uh, if you have questions. I do have a handful of questions that were submitted to our RAMP website ahead of time. So if, if it's quiet, I can refer to those. But I'll see who wants to go first. Don't know much about the. Um, first of all, I'm Kirk Atkinson. Um, I'm uh, a little concerned. We, we don't really know much more about it other than what you guys have talked about. Uh, but I noticed from the from the profiles that you put for universe, respective universities that you're still at about one third, 57 percent, and 24 percent respectively in terms of state appropriations in terms of budgets. Uh, WKU is uh, David. You can correct me, but I think we're down around 16 or 17 percent. And so I guess my concern is, have you guys been through this long enough to see as those begin to shrink more, what sort of pressure, you know, the resources become tighter and tighter, right? And so then I, I'm, I'm still concerned that we sort of get this internal infighting for those resources and it becomes an unhealthy environment. How, what, what, what can you say to that? Yeah, real quickly, I'll jump in. One on the data is, yeah, I think we are still, the appropriation proportion of income has continually gone down over decades now. Um, that's a function of two things, of course. One, the state giving us less money, but also our increase in other revenue sources impacts that as well. Um, and and we, the more successful we are at that, even if the state held steady, the, the worse the state would look. Um, the uh, Oh, I'm sorry, the second part of your question was? Uh, I guess I'm, my concern was as those uh, state appropriations diminish, I realize that you can get, obviously, if you increase tuition, I still think there's some, some, some sort of a, a price point that you're going to hit that you're not going to attract any more students, and that's one source of income, right, tuition? That's right. And then, of course, the other may be, um, you know, giving and, and, and philanthropy, that type of stuff. Uh, but my concern, I think, was as you go through this, and as our appropriations are much lower percentage-wise as a budget from what I saw from your profiles. And my concern is, is, does, is that going to create that much more of an internal tension between individual programs, respective programs within, within the university itself, when we should be trying to pull together to be a better institution and help the students as opposed to sort of like uh, uh, competing over, you know, I'll, Stealing I'll take I'll take a shot at that. I'll be quiet. I um, yeah. I mean, it it's it can generate competition. It can internal, but also can generate a good deal of cooperation. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've noticed, and I do used to do accreditation reviews. Michigan was one that stood out that has an RCM model. You you also see a good deal of self-interested, you know, self-interest-based cooperation. So we've had proliferation might be a little strong word, but, but quite a few more joint programs where you both share the investment and you share the reward, the things that we wouldn't have done otherwise. And I've noticed at other institutions the same sort of thing. It's just sort of an enlightened self-interest that develops with some experience with, with the program. It's, and it's, it's, a, it's a cautious risk sharing, but it encourages more risk than would have been the case otherwise. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, what's your name, sir? Kirk. So, Kirk, that, that's a very valid point. And uh, it's a major concern for anyone who does RCM. Will we create uh, uh, an environment of competition when colleges just think of their own welfare and not the 
university. And I think there, there are a number, and that could happen, even that could happen today with incremental model too. So, uh, but I think the, um, the benefits of transparency, the benefits of data, I think outweighs the, that concern. Because I think today, if you go to any college, any campus, and ask people, what is the major problem? Oh, we work in silos. Even without RCM, people work in silos, right? So, so RCM is maybe, is a way to expose this, and to help you do what you have to do to prevent that from happening. And I think to, to have a successful uh, RCM, you need a, a very collaborative group of deans who can work together. And this is, the, the, so when you, I know that you're hiring three new deans. So maybe one of the attributes put in the ad, Collaborative dean, you need a collaborative dean. Yeah, you need that, and I think uh, the, I think that's very important. So that's number one. Number two, you need to have a strong structure, like a, a strong curriculum committee, that will look at. Because you could say I'm an engineering dean, and I could start offering English for engineers tomorrow, right? Because the revenues will come to my college, so I'm not going to do that. But even if I am a very evil person and I want to do this, then there should be a structure at the university that will prevent that from happening. So, so I think that's a problem. And, and then we just need to do whatever we can to ensure that that, that doesn't become a, a huge, um, um, uh, maybe unintended uh, side effect or something like that. But at the same time, I think, we just need to look at the benefits and think, in my humble opinion, the benefits outweigh that concern. Yeah, I would, I, I would agree and, and, and simply um, would add that for us at NKU and, and, and uh, uh, other schools like us, the solution lies in growing enrollment. The solution does not lie in swapping students, right? So we've got to grow our overall enrollment. That for us is, is number one. And so what, what this process has really focused us all on is uh, student success. So everything from access to courses when courses are needed, access to uh, sections, uh, you know, when, when those sections are needed, uh, making sure that our time to degree is not uh, bloated uh, in, in curriculum. So it, it has reinvigorated our whole curriculum process and, and faculty uh, empowerment around curriculum and uh, uh, conversations on joint degrees. That's another thing we've seen uh, come up, not, uh, not so much joint degrees, but the um, collaboration in transdisciplinary programming. Uh, so we've seen a lot of good outcomes um, because of the very things that, that you described. Um, but they have been, in our instances, for the most part, for the better. Not without struggle, not without some hard conversations, but collaborative faculty, collaborative deans, focus on student success. If I could just add two quick points. So, um, in general, so we have about $344 million in revenues at Western, about 92% of that comes from the state, so we're at about a third there. And we have to grow to be successful, right? To be a vibrant, healthy university, revenues have to get, have to grow, and and that's what we hope this model would do. The, the other piece I would note is that Indiana does a five-year review of their model, and a faculty comment in their most recent five-year review said that there are many, this university has many barriers to collaboration. The budget model is not one of them. So when done right, I really think this can create more collaboration, not less, and, and hopefully that's what we're, we're gonna be able to create. Hi there, my name's Addie Cheney. I work in the Office of International Programs, and this is a self-interested question. Um, I'd be curious to hear about how service units have fared at your institutions as you've implemented the RCM model. Um, for instance, has there been any tension about the funding that they have received as a non-revenue generating um, unit? And then additionally, have they too, the, their allotments, are those 
at all based on performance metrics, um, like, like the academic units would be. Okay. So um, uh, there's a lot of anxiety always uh, among the support units, uh, what this means for them. Um, our governance uh, structure around the budget that I mentioned earlier has been essential in, in some success around this. Um, we, have a, we have three budget governance committees, the budget executive committee that uh, my colleague here mentioned uh, a central unit allocation committee and then a, a committee focused on space and deferred maintenance. Uh, the central unit allocation committee is really a key committee in, in helping the campus to understand why the central, the, the support units have the budgets that they have and need the budgets that they have. Maybe have more than they need, but probably have less than they need. And so the first step for us was a uh, intense process of education, educating that committee uh, for all of the uh, support units and what they do and why, how they use the funding that they have and uh, what their metrics are for success and how they fare with peers and so on and so forth. Uh, the next step then was uh, a, an informed budget request process so that at, even as we were cutting budgets, we also were engaged in reallocation across the <laughs> campus that allowed us to fund uh, requests from some of these uh, central units, some from the colleges and so forth. So it was a layered approach of first education and then uh, requests to enhance certain budgets and then we keep going from there. Those recommendations go up to the Budget Executive Committee and eventually to the President and so forth. But, but that education uh, has been the key, key part. I hope that made sense. So I think I just want to add one thing about the, uh, the governing structure. This committee that uh, Sue mentioned, the, the support unit allocation Committee. I think the composition of the committee is important because the composition, it has a, a dean or two, it has a chair or two, it has faculty, it has staff, so it's, uh, it's quite representative uh, committee and, and it does help in uh, looking at the requests from the different service units, we call them support units, and, uh, and make a recommendation to the next level. It's, um, it's something that there's continual, I don't, I don't want to say pressure, but continual vigilance, I suppose, in terms of the overhead cost. Our um, primary tool is the annual budget conferences that each of the deans has with the campus. Uh, when I was there, I would, I'd meet with the deans fairly regularly, but each dean individually after year in closing prior to with a semester break when the new enrollments were, and then we had a larger meeting with usually three academic deans, sometimes just two, and members of the Budgetary Affairs Committee, usually two, and then um, senior leaders of the campus, there are four of those. And during those meetings, the um, support units, the um, there was good back and forth feedback as to how money is being spent, why, uh, and so forth. It was a venue, an opportunity that didn't exist before. So we could have a support unit say, well, this is the list of things we do. And you could have the deans respond, well, that's all fine and good, but two of those things we never we never use. You don't have to do those anymore. Um, yeah, they could be they could be a little bit more aggressive than that. Um, one of the things we found, though, too, it in, in, in the area of student affairs, for example, now all of a sudden, you know, it's not just about the acquisition of students, but as has been pointed out here, it's about the retention of students. And all of a sudden, our deans took a lot more interest in their students and their retention than they had in the past before those were administrative sorts of things that were taken care of elsewhere. 
when they, unfortunately, I guess, saw dollar signs attached to those students. We, um, back then, we did a student satisf or senior satisfaction survey. And for the first several years of the implementation of RCM, student satisfaction went up. And that's pretty much what we, what we attributed it to was the uh, an unforeseen consequence, really, of, of this system. Hello, uh, my name is Kristen Wilson, and I'm a member of the rank and file. And so I have no, I've been on no special committees, I have no special title. So from my viewpoint, there's been no transparency and no collaboration. So my overarching question is, when is that going to start? Uh, he said we're 20 min months into the process, and I have yet to see a hint of a formula related to these cost pool allocations. We haven't heard any discussion around why uh, resident students are being treated differently than non-resident students. We have no idea what's happening with this DLO, which is listed as both a cost pool item and a auxiliary unit. Um, so when are we going to have the real conversation about the real numbers with the rank and file who are going to have to live with these uh, formulas that you all are developing in your black boxes? I'll, I'll answer that instead of the panel. Um, so uh, just to be clear, we're 20 weeks, not 20 months. Um, so, so we're you know, five months into a, an 18-month process. And of course, from an institution this size, it's, it's really hard to get to everyone. But we have, um, we have about a 14-member steering committee. We've met with all the deans. We've met with the department chairs of four or five of the colleges. We have one department chair meeting left. So again, to, to that, for us to visit with every rank and file member would be very difficult. So we're trying to method methodically go through. We've posted our information on the websites to try and communicate to everybody. So we um, we will do our best. We will do better. I apologize that we haven't gotten to you. We want to get to as many people as we can, and we're trying to go through that. And we will do that as we go through the 20-month process or the 18-month process. Um, the allocation metrics, so the specific formula, nothing has been decided. Um, the formulas for DLO haven't been decided. Those are conversations that are taking place with the steering committee. And the steering committee is putting together what we consider a straw person set of formula. Okay? Once that straw person set of formula has been created by the, by the steering committee, we're sharing all of those with the deans. Um, we are then asking the deans if those feel appropriate, and if they say yes, we will start this parallel process in which everybody will be able to see all of the formulas in a very transparent way, but nothing formal is going to be adopted, nothing formal is going to go live, nothing specific is going to happen until um, fiscal 2020. And so we are trying to go through this process starting with the broad-based steering committee, second and formed by the deans, and then third and formed by the entire campus through the parallel process, at which point we will be in a place to, to make final check, changes, edits, et cetera, and decide if this model will work better for Western than the current external model. But at week 20, we simply haven't been able to get to every rank and file member, and I, I apologize, and we will try and do better. If there are committees or groups that we would like to, that you would like us to talk to, we will jump and come there. Uh, but uh, I apologize for, for the frustration you're feeling, and um, we'll move to the next question if that's okay. Good afternoon. Brandon Goldsby from the Department of Art. Two of the institutions in front of us today have just stepped forward into this process, and in fact have said that they have just completed a shadow year where I, I assume you ran both budgets side by side. What was the determination to go ahead and make this shift? Who decided that you were on a better path? I, I think we both said that we just completed our first live year. Okay. okay. Well, let's, let's go back a Let's year go back a year. And say yeah. you ran the shadow year. What was the determination that said, 
this is the way we need to go, that, that this is a better process that we're seeing. Well, I, I, would, I would say let's go back a couple of more years even, um, because it, 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 it's about the principles at play. Um, uh, for us at NKU, we, we wanted something that made sense, was data informed, was transparent, was um, relatively simple and predictable that would incentivize growth, would incentivize other things that we could decide as, as we went along, put student success first. We had a whole series of things that we wanted our budget model to support. Um, and so the decision to move from a centralized, non-transparent, uh, incremental budget model to this other thing was, was really based on what we believed we could do with it. It was the, the running of the numbers through the actual formulas and all that simply informed us as we went along that we were on the right track, that it, it, it was going to, to help us to support our goals. In and of itself, it, it doesn't do anything for you. You have to decide what your goals are and then make sure that uh, the model will support you. And so I would say it was an iterative process through the first two years or so of planning that told us those things. So uh, I can also add a couple of things here. I don't think the, your question maybe implied, I could be wrong, but implied that the shadow, the purpose of the shadow year is to decide at the end of the year whether we're gonna do it next year or not. That wasn't the purpose. So the purpose, uh, so the, this process, it's, we've been uh, in conversation and implementing uh, aspects of the model for the last four or five years. So it's not just uh, like that. So um, there are some decisions, back to your point about the, the formulas and the levers, there are some decisions that need to be made, what we call the model levers. These are the things that you tweak, that you change. Uh, for example, let's say you have a student, a student has a college of record and a college of instruction. I have an engineering student is a college of record is engineering and then when they take an English class then the college of instruction is arts and sciences so a decision was made that we're going to split that tuition in a certain way the collective wisdom of the group was to do it 60 40 maybe other universities will do it 70, 70 30, 30 or something so but for us it was like that so it took us a while to get to that point it wasn't just like that and it took us a number of what if questions we started with doing it uh, maybe 70 30 and then we came up to the conclusion that 60 40 for us is the best thing okay and then other decisions uh, the money that comes from the state not only the tuition the money that comes from the state how are we going to allocate this money so again the collective wisdom was well we want to encourage research so we're going to take 70 percent of what we get from the state we will allocate based on credit hour generation and 30 percent of what we get we are going to allocate based on research expenditure again that wasn't a single person decision that wasn't her own decision that was a collective decision from uh, the, the i think the steering committee plays a major role in uh, getting us started with something to look at and then the discussion with the deans discussion with the faculty, discussion with the University Senate. The University Senate plays a major role. The Budget Committee of the University Senate plays a major role in also looking at these uh, numbers and giving uh, feedback. And then at the end, we say, okay, now we decided to go. So we lock those levers, lock them meaning, okay, not forever, but at least for three years, because it will be dangerous if we change the levers every year, right? Oh yeah, engineering is doing bad now, let's see increase this or decrease that. So we say we're gonna lock them for three years, five years in Indiana, you go review. Maybe in our case, we're gonna review every three years and see where we are. So I, I'm sorry if I'm taking long, but I just wanted to explain the picture uh, in once we have all these things. And I think 
uh, you said 17 week. What did you say? 17 weeks. You are in 17 weeks. Yeah. So this is this is. You still have a long journey. It took us four years to get to <laughs> to to say that we are now finishing the uh, the the live year. Five years actually. Yeah. So this is too early still. I'm sure there will be. I hope there will be more conversations. straw-person model, which is going next to the Dean's Council and would then be used for assuming that all goes as planned. That would then be used for the parallel year, at which case we would identify unintended consequences, problems, things that don't work, and you would make changes throughout the whole parallel process. As I assume all of you made changes through the parallel process. I'm not putting words in your mouth. I, I just want to mention one thing. In, in allocating the space, we had to tweak some of those at the end of that parallel years because some units, they, we, we have a big aviation school. So the aeroplane hangars, so it's huge, right? So, so we needed to do something about that, right? So we, we had to tweak certain things. Just to be clear, in order to think about what we would look like in a different world with a new model, we have to build a model. To build a model, we have to make assumptions and we have to come up with algorithms, right? And all of those algorithms can be changed, but in order to test something, we have to populate them first. And so through discussions with the steering committee, we have put forth a set of assumptions that we're considering the straw person model which is then shared and reviewed, collect, we collect feedback on it, we make changes, we fix things, and we ultimately want to get to a place where everyone, or as many people as we can, as possible, will feel that that model better positions Western for the future than today's model, right? And, and we talk about these formulas. Right now, nobody in this room knows any formula because there is no formula, right? There's no justification for anybody's budget other than that's what they got last year. So history is the only justification we have today. And so coming up with a justification is very difficult and lots of different perspectives. And we want to do our best to bring all of those perspectives together, draw a line in the sand, and then get feedback about how that line should move. And that's precisely what we're trying to do. And again, we'll try and do better at it, but that is the plan that we're trying to get to. Hello, I'm Alex Poole from the Department of English. Uh, maybe Sue, you'd be the best one to talk to this because you're in, also in a state which unfortunately does not invest in higher education very much. I think Curtis said it's about 16% is from the state, which is quite unbelievable. I remember, what, I'll just say, when I was a kid, my dad told me, do you know that University of Michigan is almost a private school because 51% of its funding doesn't come from the state? <laughs> <laughs> now I think about that. So, oh my gosh, if we had 49%, that'd be a miracle. <laughs> but I really worry about, and this model greatly concerns me, and tell me what you think about this, and the others too, that it is, we're going towards a system kind of like the federal government Congress, where long-term planning is almost, seems like it's going to be impossible, because at least in Kentucky, every budget cycle, we get hit. And then if the this model is dependent upon enrollment and other things. It can fluctuate the money you get wildly, you know, from year to year or from cycle to cycle. And then so if you're a department, you say, gosh, we have a five-year goal of doing this, and we're going to need these resources to do that. With all those variables changing constantly, it seems impossible to do. It does feel that way. Um... <laughs> And, uh, I mean, it, it puts a lot of burden on those of us who are involved in enrollment projections to be as accurate as possible. Um, we have to, uh, we ha Northern, we have to grow. We have to grow, we have to grow. And so as we continue to project, 
you know, 0.5% down in enrollment, 1.5% uh, down. You know, it, it feels like we're not turning this boat around at all, but we are. The demographics are changing. We are getting better at competition with our Northern Kentucky environment. Uh, we are uh, launching programs that are very competitive and unique. We are uh, being more aggressive in the online uh, environment. Um, we, we are, you know, um, opening the Health Innovation Center and, and expanding greatly our health programs. So we see a future where that growth is going to happen, but we still have to be incredibly precise about um, where we're going to fall backwards and where we're going to make some small steps forward. Um, the um, tuition dependency that we feel is not going to change. It's going to continue to get um, worse. I hate to use that word. Um, it's an opportunity, right? But it's going to doesn't feel very good, but um, it, 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 it's gonna, that's the way it's going to be. And so um, we have to be more innovative, more entrepreneurial. And what I appreciate about what our new budget model is doing for us is that it is incentivizing that behavior on campus. Our conversations on campus have totally changed. Our, our faculty senate budget committee is they are the most educated about this model. They are, the, they ask the hardest questions. They, they try to get the best information out. They, the website is, is super because they're very vigilant about it. And um, so I just, um, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, well, yeah, so for, for us, that's not going to work. That we're good where we're at thing, that's not working. That's not working for us. And it's not going to work. And what we do have is we have that subvention fund that we can use to reward that behavior that we want to. I, I, uh, I understand your point, and it's well taken. It's, uh, you're in, an, in a volatile environment, and you're having to look at things at the school level, at least, that you haven't had to look at before. You're looking at a smaller data set, so you're exposed to you know, not so many offsetting inaccuracies in your, in your projections. One of the reactions we've seen on the part of uh, some of the schools we've worked with at the school or college level is a... Um, a real managed risk taking in that they build up reserves mm -hmm. that they hadn't had before. And when they have reserves at a particular level, um, I could give you percents of difference work with, but when they get <clears throat> reserves, then, then they begin to take risks. Mm -hmm. But the risks they know they can afford to fail. Um, it, it, it improves the planning process of the environment, but it, but it doesn't make it Easy. I'll just That's add quickly, point. one of the principles that the steering committee came up with is that the model should have a shared commitment to fiscal health. And so the straw person model does have kind of these central funding mechanisms like Sue just mentioned, which are there to provide a buffer to risk taking. And if and if things change for a college, it's not expected that their resources change immediately, that there are timing <laughs> lags and there are central resources that are meant to support that because we don't want this to be kind of an uh, autonomy model where everybody is acting on their own. Uh, Klaus Ernst, I'm in the Department of Mathematics. Um, there are certain programs which are inherently more expensive to run, uh, particularly you come from computer science engineering, you mentioned aerospace. Uh, mass is cheap, we just need a blackboard. So how are the decisions made that uh, some programs inherently need additional resources than others? Um, does this model lead to um, um, differentiated tuition rates depending on what kind of class you take, 
or are there programs which are essentially eternally subsidized? Okay, I, let me take a shot at this. I think the, uh, the model doesn't determine whether you do a differential tuition or not. This is a decision that, that you as a university decide whether this is the best thing for you or not. Uh, the, for example, we had a conversation earlier today. Uh, some of the guiding principles of University A is maybe access, equity, these kind of things. So maybe everybody should be the same in other universities. No, engineering and computer science and aerospace and nursing and music music more expensive than, than others and they need to be treated differently. So I think I want to separate the, the decision whether it's differential tuition or not. And, and some universities, they, uh, they do program fees and course fees to emulate the differential tuition. Now, so uh, the way this, I think this is how I explain RCM, our model to my faculty and my staff and my students. So my college, we collect our share of the tuition. We collect our share of the state appropriation. So this is step number one, revenues. And then we pay for our direct expenses, step number two. And then we pay for the support unit allocation, step number three. And then we pay a percentage, we call it the participation fee for subvention. Step number four, and then anything left is, at the end there is a margin. If it's positive, then this is something that I keep, I could invest with. If I'm in negative, then I should make a case to be sub V. Now, step number four, every college pays this percentage. We call it the subvention participation fee, or you can call it tax, if you will. So this is a pool that is kept centrally to help in two, uh, actually in three major ways. Number one, mission programs. For example, you have a program that is part of our mission, and we have to have that program, but that program will never have a positive margin. Then that subvention uh, pool could help in that regard. Number two, maybe more expensive programs. So some programs maybe need to be they will always be in the negative and need to be subvened because they are expensive. Then there it will uh, help. And then the third purpose is the investment, long-term investment. And this is what we call strategic initiatives that should align with the strategic plan and the goals of the university. So, so these are different ways to deal with these uh, situations. Yeah, so um, in, in our university, we have program fees uh, for certain colleges, nursing, business, engineering, and then course fees for other programs to compensate for that. I, I suggest that you know, <clears throat> this is a university. You know, it's not just a collection of colleges that share too few parking spaces. They, um, <clears throat> It's what you and you want to build and continue to have a university that's related. So what we've done is, and I think it's probably fairly symptomatic of others, is say, well, for example, business. Uh, they can justify a program fee, and given their students' placement records, they can probably afford a program fee. We have a school of music that we think very highly of. It's an expensive program. And their, you know, the, the starting salaries aren't what they are in business. Their, their subsidy actually has continued to grow. That's a campus decision. It's, we, you know, it's, it's, it's what we value on the campus, a balanced campus to the degree we can pull it off. What I would just underscore is none of these decentralized models suggest or recommend it or drive that, it, that colleges or schools need to break even or turn a profit. That's not the point. The point is to understand where our resources are coming from and where they're going. And so it doesn't drive a profit motive, and you don't have to have a profit in order to have a carry forward and to have go forward uh, investment. <coughs> And, and thank you for saying this, Angie, because I think the, it was a, 
a misconception. Everybody wanted to look at the bottom line and want to be in the black and, oh, I'm not in the black, then we are doing something wrong. No, I think it's okay to be in deficit and should some programs, maybe they will always be in deficit. They have to. I think they're needed, expensive. So I think with this mentality, I think we, the, the, the model will succeed. But if, I have to warn against this, if we expect every department, every, every college, let's talk about the college level, to be in the black all the time, then that will never happen, in my humble opinion. But I think what this model will do, it will really empower the deans to be more entrepreneurial, to be more um, creative in finding ways to create more sources of revenues in light of the decline in state support and in light of the dependency on tuition only. Now, one of the things that I, gives me pause a little bit in discussions like this, it seems that, and I include me in this, um, we, we tend to talk about ourselves without coming back to, you know, why are we here? I mean, we're here for students. We don't want to make a profit at their expense. What we want to do, I mean, the reason we're here is we want to deliver the best product that serves them in the long run. And we're, you know, we're constantly searching for tools that help us accomplish that. And this is, you know, one of those tools, imperfect, but, um, you know, has experienced some success. Can you talk about any impact that the models have had on the ratios of adjunct faculty to tenure faculty? Well, I can. Um, um, Again, I, I often i am very cautious about saying the model doesn't do anything on its own. It, 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 it's a tool we use. Having said that, um, we have become increasingly reliant on uh, part-time instructors rather than full-time uh, and, and uh, particularly tenure, tenure track, uh, full-time. Uh, and, and as our SACS reaccreditation approaches, that has been a real concern. It's the kind of thing that keeps a provost up at night. Um, and so one of the things that the model has facilitated on our campus was the conversation around resources that are available to academic affairs for instructional capacity. And the sheer fact that because of the budget reductions year after year after year and giving up faculty lines, we are in a position where we are dangerously close to not being in compliance when SACS looks at our peer institutions and compares our balance of full-time faculty with part-time faculty. And I could make that case year after year after year, but making that case this year during the time when we were going through not only our budget reductions, as I know you've had to do as well, but also our budget requests as part of the budget model process the requests come from reallocations across the campus. That means that everyone involved on campus has to say this is an important enough request that we're going to fund it by essentially internally cutting our own budgets and reallocating those funds over. And we were awarded uh, $2.3 million by the rest of the campus for 21 new tenure tenure track faculty positions because the model created the space for that conversation to happen. And it created the vehicle by which that reallocation could take place. So we, I cut my own budget. Uh, we all cut our own budgets. And, and that wasn't the only thing we funded. But that will go a long ways to helping us be in a better position um, with our reaccreditation. So that's, that's kind of an example of how the model didn't do that, but the model provided the vehicle and the space in which that could take place. 
that's an important point. I think one of the questions that was submitted to our website was that uh, essentially that does this model absolve leaders from difficult decisions because the model uses formulas to simply spit out numbers? Oh, wow. Can I, can I say something about this? I think the model within the college, I think it's, uh, I, I try to separate between uh, data-informed decision and data-driven decision. Data-informed, just we use the data, and, and that model provided us with the data to inform our decision making. But the decision is not generated automatically by a formula. I think I want to make that clear. Another thing, and then I'm going to give you a chance to ask the question. Uh, the, uh, I think I just want to tell you that uh, what's happening here happened exactly the same, the same question, the same concerns. In my university many years ago, and I'm sure in other universities, so this is very healthy, very good, and uh, the, 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 the questions are very valid. The second point I want to make is because budget reduction was mentioned multiple times. Please, let's not confuse budget cuts with this model. That, happened, that was one of the problems in my college, in my university, actually. That the first time we did this shadow system, then we were hit by 20% budget cut. So everybody blamed what? Blame the new model, right? The new model did nothing. It's just the budget cut came from the state, right? So I just want to make that separation. Thank you. Danita Kelly, College of Health and Human Services. You may have answered this somewhat, but I was wondering how decisions are made about hiring new faculty. What have you found to be helpful, successful? Um, if you have an idea for a new program, right, do you grow the number first? And, or, you know, how does, how does that happen? What has happened, and it may not have been implemented long enough at all of them, but have you seen changes in some things in the classrooms? Site, cl classroom capacity? Have there, you know, have there been some alterations that you found have, <coughs> that folks are doing to be more successful? Or, I mean, whether, you know, I could say whether they want to or not, <laughs> but, you know, or, or what types of strategic decisions are they having to make? on a day-to-day -day basis, a semester basis, that is helping them to be successful. Thank you. I, I, I just want to give one quick example to your last point. Um, one of the things that could happen is um, we could disincentivize team teaching, for example, because it's more expensive, right? Um, we wanted to make sure that we didn't disincentivize it. In a way, we kind of incentivized it by um, having every everyone t involved in the team teaching receiving a full credit for course load and, and by um, really fully sharing uh, in the revenue um, stream. Um, so again, you, you set what your priorities are, and then you make the technical, mechanical decisions that will support that. As a provost, our hiring uh, process hasn't changed. The deans still submit uh, by working with their chairs and faculty their hiring plans for my approval. I can still reallocate lines across colleges. Uh, I would hope I wouldn't need to do that, um, and so far I haven't, but I could. The yeah, the dollars would follow. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you, you want your pro <laughs> speaking as provost, uh, you, you want your provost to be able to really help across the university in the same way that he or she has been able to in the past. So you don't want to, you don't want to tie their hands in, in that kind of a way. But hopefully, the faculty lines that are in the colleges when the motto goes live stay in the colleges because they're needed there and the resources are aligned. But that may not be always be true, and you may have to make changes, and so that can happen. Um, you asked about some other things I, I don't remember, but. 
Our, so our faculty hiring hasn't changed. Um, One question was innovation in the classroom. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Oh, the size, like the size of the classes. We, what we've done is we've gotten better at managing our enrollment by filling sections rather than op before we open new ones. Uh, again, if we're going to increase the size of a class, it, it needs to be sound uh, from a pedagogical standpoint and not, we shouldn't be doing it because of dollar signs. Now, we have a unique, kind of unique uh, thing on campus is that our space wasn't built to accommodate large classes. We don't have large spaces on campus. Uh, and so um, we are limited in that even if we wanted to do. Um, however, some departments have experimented with larger class sizes. And, and have decided that there is, that they have found some benefit, that they have found certain faculty who enjoy teaching in that environment. And so it has spurred innovation and experimentation. Sometimes it, they decide that's not a good idea. But enrollment management, no matter what, is key. And that's key whether we're in a, no matter what kind of budget model we're in. I think we're about two minutes over, but is there a final burning question that anyone wants to ask? If not, um, thank you for coming and thank you to our panelists.